Hi everyone, I'm Sean Buckley. Uh, hopefully you know me by now, but I'm one of your uh, TAs this semester, and I will be giving a uh, lecture today, um, sending in for Dr. Ross, who's away um, on history official business. Um, so today what we're going to be talking about is the second wave of imperialism and the scramble for Africa uh, more specifically. Now we've talked about imperialism before in this class, sort of first wave of imperialism beginning in uh, 1492 when Columbus uh, rhymingly uh, crossed the ocean. But this is the second wave uh, of imperialism, um, one that sort of fits into our theme of industrialization and civilization that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. See, this imperialism was sort of a mad dash to sort of take over the rest of the world, not just the Americas, but Africa and parts of Asia as well. And so we, we have a sort of helpful term, or um, sort of three letters, the three Gs, for why imperialism took place in the 1800s, the God, gold, and glory. The God you should be probably uh, familiar with from earlier in the semester. Um, the idea that white Europeans need to sort of go across the ocean, go to Africa, go to Asia, and spread Christianity and civilization uh, to the rest of the world. Now this time around, um, this sort of impulse was a little bit more toned down than before. Um, but you should sort of keep that in mind. It is part of the reason. If we were sort of doing a graph, it would be the sort of smallest part on there. The second part is gold, the sort of quest for money and resources and markets um, across the world. As industrialism uh, ramps up, there's a need for new markets, and uh, Marx, who we talked about earlier in the week, talked about late-stage capitalism, sort of needed imperialism, that eventually the markets would sort of uh, shore up in uh, Europe, and there would be a need to sort of find new markets uh, in Africa and Asia and the rest of the world, uh, because there would be no one left in Europe to sort of buy and make these products. However, the biggest point, at least in my view, is this new imperial nationalistic sense of taking, uh, taking over new lands uh, to sort of compete with other European countries. This idea that you need to take these new markets, this new land, before other European countries could. Because there's this new spirit of nationalism, this new spirit that our European country is better than the other European countries. And so there's this new sort of sense of competition amongst European countries. Um, just think of it like, my dog loves toys, but the toys she loves most are the toys that the other dogs want to have as well. So this is the sort of idea that's happening with Europe. They want to take over these other countries to show that they're better than the other European countries. But we should start at the beginning, because it is such a wonderful place to start. Now this is pre-colonial Africa. You'll see here that this is the sort of map you're used to seeing. These aren't the sort of nation states you're used to seeing sort of nicely lined out with nicely drawn lines, showing you where each country starts and ends. Instead, they're sort of oddly shaped sort of kingdoms that are sort of loosely based on land, but are mostly sort of based on ideas of who rules what these small regions are with large swaths of land that aren't controlled by any sort of particular ruler. Instead, uh, Africa is mostly made up of some sort of small kinship-based tribes with some idea of sort of leadership, uh, sort of matrim uh, matrimonial sort of leaders of tribes, um, but mostly this is sort of about connections to the land. Generations who sort of understand their, sort of their religious and social base on the land, and their sort of kinship ties, their sort of ties to family. So this is less about sort of your, who rules you, and more about how you feel about the land and the people who live on that land. And this is Africa in 1914, the sort of end, or the beginning of World War, or World War I, at the sort of height of, an, uh, of imperialism. And you can see this is not just these sort of well-defined spaces of different states, but also these sort of swaths of who, what European country is controlling this. Essentially, they have remade Africa into a sort of Europeanized uh, continent full of Europeanized states. Now I want to talk about this idea of a civilizing mission of imperialism. Um, 
this idea that they were going to spread religion across the world, to sort of bring Christianity to these sort of savage nations. And this is obviously sort of downplayed. Uh, sort of post-enlightenment theory is more secularized. And not only that, but even the sort of religious leaders who do come to Africa and Asia are really more there to sort of lead the Europeans who make their ways to colonies. They're there for sort of spiritual guidance to those Europeans who have made their ways to other parts of the world. But there's other sort of uh, civilizing ideas too. This idea that we're going to make them smarter, we're going to bring them European goods and traditions and sort of teach them how to be more European, to be more sort of evolved. And I just want to show you this little cartoon here. Um, Ali Sloper, as I take a uh, glass of water, Ali Sloper is this sort of comic cartoon figure in Victorian England. You can think of him as sort of this um, uh, Homer Simpson or sort of Peter Griffin figure. He's a lower class, but he wants to be richer. He wears these nice clothes that he's found in the alley that are tattered, but he thinks you know, it makes him more presentable. But he is the lowest of the low of, of European society. And yet, every now and then, in these cartoons, they'll send him abroad to other countries and he'll sort of mock them. And here is him. He went to Africa in this uh, cartoon. And earlier on in this cartoon, he meets um, a woman who he, through some odd African ritual he doesn't understand, he ends up married to her. And he can't believe how gross and disgusting she is. And now he's married to this woman in Africa. And here's this cartoon where he's playing a game with an African savage. And he just wants to show this simple little dice game to this African savage to show him what Europeans do for fun. And the African loves it, even though he loses. Because you see, even the, Af yeah, like, the African is so simple that he doesn't even understand the concept of winning and losing the way that Europeans do. And it just shows you the European idea that even Ali Slover, this sort of cartoon who was at the bottom of European society, is still miles ahead of these African savages. They need to go across the ocean and uh, across these uh, rivers and streams to go make sure they understand how great European society is and to lift them up into European society. But of course, I talked about the sort of biggest piece of that pie of why they went is international rivalry. Um, we have this new imperialism, it's spurred on uh, by this quest for new markets, but it's also about taking up these markets so that other European countries don't get them. Of course, you'll remember at the beginning of the semester, we sort of began talking about these religious wars going on in Europe and the sort of peace that is eroded in Europe because there's all of these countries and religious factions going to war with one another. But all of that was sort of put to rest by the peace of Westphalia. But that's an uneasy peace. These countries are sort of natural rivals. And that peace that allowed for the first wave of imperialism is really uneasy and can sort of fall apart at the sort of first sign of trouble. And in the 1800s, there was no first sign of trouble. There was a downpour of trouble. You have revolutions in France, Germany, Spain, Haiti that sort of restructure the way that Europeans' political lives were. At the same time, that led to Napoleon and began the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s and late 1700s. And so you have these new leaders of Europe who don't abide by the same principles and sense of honor that these old monarchs did. So you have a new political landscape of Europe, and at the same time, you have this new industrialism that sends people into new markets. Um, and so this sense of competition is beginning to grow. And not only that, but that idea of a civilizing mission, that there were these savages that were different than us, didn't just uh, belong to sort of white versus black. There was also a sort of national identity and a national superiority that exists. And this idea that England believes they are far superior than France. They agree, French, because they're white, are far above these savages in Africa and Australia and America, but they're still below. So let's go back to Ali Slover, who goes to Paris to see the Paris Exhibition. Um, Dr. Haynes' uh, last uh, class talked about this sort of crystal palace, this um, show of industrial might in England. Paris had their own exhibition, and Ali Slover goes to go see it and see how it compares to the England Exhibition. 
So he talks about the fact that he's so excited to go to Paris because he's heard about all of these beautiful women in Paris. And he wants to go see them. Instead, he goes to Paris, and all of these French women, they look like this. This is what French women look like. And he can't understand where are all the beautiful women until finally he goes and he walks down um, the beach and he sees this beautiful woman reading a book um, on, the, on the beach. It's the first woman he's seen even reading, these, these uncultured uh, Parisians who are so ugly and they don't read. And he finally sees one, when you know who won the pony. It's actually a British woman who is on uh, vacation in Paris just like him. So you see there is a sort of hierarchy, a sort of national hierarchy, as well as a racial hierarchy going on as well, which is also fostering this competition among uh, European societies. It's not just about economics, there's also a sort of national pride going on here too. Now at the same time this is going on, so going back to these sort of social ideas of imperialism, while this is going on, industrialism, enlightened thinking, and new scientific thinking is also bringing uh, upon new ideas about biology and the way the world works, the way um, that human beings came to exist, the way in which we evolve over time. Um, and this all sort of stems from this idea of sort of Darwin's natural selection theory. Now, the way that um, this sort of all comes about is a little complicated, but essentially that Darwin and others at his time had come up with this idea of sort of survival of the fittest, that uh, creatures essentially evolve over time to adapt to their surroundings. And the most fit, um, the mo those built best for survival are the ones that go on. And eventually you have theorists, uh, philosophers, um, even uh, scientists believing that you can sort of bring this um, to human evolution. Now, people like Darwin bring this to the idea that women and men have evolved differently over time to where men are more appropriate to lead, uh, that white men have grown uh, smarter over time and thus they are more equipped to lead, while Africans sort of, the African people are better to work. But there's also this idea of a social uh, Darwinism. This idea that there are people who are richer have evolved better over time, that they have figured out uh, the way in which to become richer. That it wasn't just a matter of luck, but these people are actually more evolved than the working classes. So you're starting to see this evolutionary theory coming, not just about biology, but about economics and the way in which the world works. All of society is evolving in different ways. And you see this play out in, um, in imperialism. You have the white man's burden, uh, which many of you have probably heard of. This idea uh, that we are, uh, Rupert Kipling uh, came up with, this idea that it's actually the duty of Europeans to go to Africa and all these different places to uplift them. And that eventually, even if they uh, say that they don't want it, that eventually they will thank you because white men are going to lift them up into the next phase of society, which they so need to get to. Now it's important to remember uh, that this sort of imperial identity necessarily was supported by those in Europe, those sort of, the sort of regular people in Europe, and it actually took over their imagination. In part, for that nationalist identity, this idea that our country is better than the other country. But also there are all these other things happening too. There's a picture here of um, the white man's burden and it's for the pear soap, this idea that you need to sort of use this soap to whiten yourself up, to make sure you clean off the dirt from you, that you don't sort of blacken yourself up, that you need to be whiter. But there's also other things happening here that are sort of spurred on by imperialism. There are things uh, like adventurers who sort of capture the imagination of people. You have newspapers showing Africa and all these animals that no one's ever seen before. Zoos that show people in England they've never seen before. People in England have never seen a tiger or an elephant before, and imperialism is bringing this stuff to them. The sort of crystal uh, palace that we talked about before, 
was bringing in all these things from all these countries that uh, England has taken over. And it shows what we can do. It shows all of these different places. However, imperialism also leads to anxieties. You have these new intellectuals um, and leaders of Britain and other European countries thinking, how are we going to make sure that we're dominant over these people? How can we sort of prove and make sure that all of these sort of evolutionists are right, that white Europeans are better than everyone else, when you see a, a degeneration happening in their country? They, they believe that there was something happening that was bringing Europeans down. The old aristocracy is getting fat in their farms. Uh, the wealthy industrialists are getting fat and lazy, counting all their money. And you have these poor working class people working in the factories, and all they do is work all day and then drink all their money away at night. How are we going to keep this up when it seems as if our own society is crumbling around? And so that's when you get things like muscular Christianity, this idea that a good Christian European is going to build up their bodies. They're going to sort of work out and play sports, and we're going to make ourselves stronger so we can lead. We're going to move away from alcohol and not spend all our money on drink, especially those poor people who can't control themselves. We have to make sure they can't get to alcohol so they can't ruin the great white race. You get all of these things happening that are spurred on by imperialism. And so imperialism isn't just affecting uh, these other countries. It's also affecting Europe. It's changing their society, their culture, and everything around them. But of course, um, we need uh, to sort of go to how was in this imperialism different? How was it sort of made possible? What sort of defines this wave of imperialism? And the number one factor is industrialism. We've talked about industrialism in the past few lectures, but it really is the key. Without industrialism, this wave of imperialism is impossible. Now the first reason is because of medicine. Um, for the first, or for the last couple of hundred years before this, West Africa specifically was considered the white man's grave. Essentially, uh, white men, like the Native Americans who couldn't deal with the sort of diseases Europeans have brought over to the Americas, uh, white uh, Europeans were not resistant to the diseases that they were finding in Africa. However, developing germ theory, this idea that Europeans began to understand where diseases come from, and the development of vaccines, uh, such as vaccines for malaria, allowed uh, Europeans to dig deeper into Africa than they ever could before. Perhaps even more importantly was the development of new weapons, uh, such as the machine gun um, and the great cannons that were being developed at this time. Of course, uh, the coast of Africa and even sort of slightly into the interior of Africa had been sort of slowly worn down by the slave trade. Um, European slave trade uh, had sort of wiped out a lot of populations, and not just wiped out a lot of population, but it also decentralized governments, changed the way in which kingdoms ran. And so not only were these uh, countries in Africa sort of destabilized and depopulized. Um, but also the idea is that you have these guns that are far superior to any of the guns that the Africans have, making it a lot easier to sort of dominate these people. And so the scramble for Africa begins officially in 1884 and 1885 with the Berlin Conference. King Leopold II of Belgium um, even amongst European leaders, was a bit eccentric, I guess we should say, and that other European leaders um, were sort of weary of him and sort of how he would approach Africa. At the same time, there were spaces like the Congo and places in interior Africa where Europeans were sort of afraid that European countries would get into conflicts with each other over this land, and so the idea was we're all going to come together and we're going to sort of make a code of conduct about how we're going to take over land, specifically in Africa, to make sure that the European countries would not start a war, let's say World War I, over um, these 
contested imperial lands. And so it was essentially decided that in order for a European country to take control over land, they had to show sustained control over that land. Essentially, these were the rules of conduct so that this unsettled peace that I talked about earlier was maintained, and so that the leaders of Europe could, and eventually America sort of could grab their pieces of the African cake. Now, it's probably obvious to you at this point, but there were actually no Africans at this meeting. This was a strictly European meeting, and the Africans had no say in this. Now, it's important to say that the Europeans didn't just come in and say, we want your land, and the Africans just rolled over. Um, you see um, people like Samari Touré, from relatively sort of humble merchant background, built a new state on the upper Niger by training soldiers to use imported rifles. Uh, he, he declared himself commander of the faithful, uh, and he leaded a sort of jihad movement against uh, unbelievers. And he even sort of avoided the French, because he sort of had this control over the interior of Africa. He had, he sort of ruled with an iron fist. However, eventually the French came for him, as they came for all in Africa. And Samori would sort of driven out all of these other sort of African people and had taken this sort of iron rule, had no one sort of help him against the French forces. And so what you're seeing, especially in this space, is that eventually these people are sort of taken over. And you're seeing sort of similar um, stories that you saw, like say the Aztecs. You're seeing these sort of similar things happen, where they're sort of dividing and conquering. And so, these sort of imperial resistance was squashed, in part because of the, um, the evolution in weaponry, and in part because of a serious lack of empathy or morality which takes place in Africa. So the Herero um, were these, essentially these farmers uh, in Africa. They were cattle herders. Um, and eventually, they sort of ended up in what we would say sort of German land, uh, but it was essentially their land until the Germany um, came in 1885. And so, when the Germans came, they resisted. They fought back um, in what ways they could. But even that minor resistance was not to be tolerated. And so you get this um, from the German Kaiser. The Rero people must, however, leave the land. If the populace does not do this, I will force them with a grouped cannon. Within the German borders, every Rero, with or without a gun, with or without cattle, will be shot. I will no longer accept women and children. I will drag them back to their people, or I will let them be shot at. These are my words to the Rero people. That is it. That is his only statement. This is a German leader who has never been to this part of, the, of Africa. He will never see these people. He does not know these people. But he has ordered them coldly, in one short paragraph, to be exterminated simply for their existence. It's hard to know how many people actually died. Um, the estimates are between 25,000 and 100,000. Essentially, by the end of this genocide, there were no Herero people left. However, the most um, enduring image of violence in Africa to the Belgian Congo. It is uh, feared, this is where the Europeans will clash, as I said before, so King Leopold II says, I will take over it. But I, I'm not actually going to take over imperial rule, I'm going to make it the free state of Congo so that we can all enjoy the riches of Congo. At this time, Congo was a space in which uh, created rubber, which is a new sort of industrial material that people needed. And so the free state of Congo was made. Instead, this was not a free state at all. Instead, uh, the people in the Belgian Congo were forced to work uh, essentially 20 to 24 hours a day. Uh, they were tortured. They were enslaved. and because they did not want resistance, as we have seen before, 
they made sure there would be no resistance. Um, any worker that stopped working would have their uh, wives and children um, taken from them, and if they still did not work, that those wives and children would be murdered. And for those wives and children, if they did not work, they would have their hands cut off. Because, it's pretty easy to understand, if you're not working hard enough, then why do you need hands anyway? And so this is the violence, which is the reason why you don't see more resistance in Africa. Because it's not simply that they have better weapons. It is that they are willing and able to do whatever it takes to take over and dominate these lands and make sure that anyone that survives will work when and where they ask them to. However, eventually, even Leopold uh, II is taken down. Uh, other Europeans see that this violence is taking place. And eventually, the Free State of Congo is taken away from Belgian control. But this is only after hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, have been enslaved, tortured, and murdered. Now, when we come back to you next time, we'll talk about the ways in which this imperialism eventually leads to World War I. This European conflict that has been sort of tried to mediate um, will eventually break down. However, we tend to think of these things in a Western point of view. How does imperialism end up leading to white people killing one another? But I want to sort of remind you that this has very long-term effects for Africa as well. When imperialism ends, that's not where all of this suffering ends. Instead, over the past 50 years, here's a brief list of the civil wars which have taken place because of the power vacuum created by imperialism. You'll see that many of these places, Liberia, the Sudan, um, in other spaces, didn't have one civil war, but two civil wars. Again, this is in the past 50 years, and this is not the complete list. This is the amount of this is the amount of wars that I could fit on this slide. And so, when uh, the Europeans said we're going to go to Africa, and we're going to sort of show them the way that Europeans live, we're going to bring to them European society. They weren't lying, because what they brought to Africa was political turmoil over statehood that would lead to the death and destruction of generations of people, just like in Europe. And on that happy note, I want to say thank you guys so much um, for having me as a lecturer. I want to thank Dr. Haynes and Dr. Ross for letting me do this. And um, I hope everyone has a fantastic spring break. And uh, I will see you next time.